So yesterday we finished up talking about acid catalyzed hydration. We said that essentially it's a reverse of that E1 elimination reaction that we saw last term. And we said that the first step of this reaction is you protonate your alcohol, or the water in this case, and then your alkene will steal a proton from that protonated alcohol, forming the most stable carbocation. And then your neutral alcohol will attack the carbocation. And then last but not least, you have a proton transfer step. It's really similar to the reaction we saw just essentially in reverse, right? And we said that because it's so similar, we have to be very careful with our reaction conditions. If we wanna do the elimination reaction, we wanna have heat, obviously, and then we wanna have a strong concentrated acid. But if we wanna do the addition reaction, we actually wanna flood the reaction with water and run it at a much lower temperature. So let's start off with a challenge problem for warm up. For this challenge problem, we've got an alkene and an alcohol in the exact same molecule, and we've got catalytic acid. So there's no water around in this reaction, just the starting material and catalytic acid. So I'll give you guys a minute to work on this, but try to use the same procedural steps that we did above, but use it towards the starting molecule. Once you think you got it, check with your neighbor too. Yeah, you can assume it's a generic concentrated catalytic acid, though. So um, there's no water around is what I'm essentially saying. I'll give you guys a hint, too. What's the fastest reaction in chemistry? Acid-base. Acid -base. What's the most basic site on this molecule? The alkene or the oxygen? Oxygen. So the oxygen lone pair is going to be protonated in that first step. You guys want another hint? I'll give you a generic vague hint. Number your carbons. It's super easy to forget carbons. So let's get a show of some thumbs. How many of you guys think you're at least on the right track getting close? Okay. The last hint I'll give you guys is for every one mole of starting material, you get one mole of products out.
All right, it looks like a handful of people are uh, pretty confident with their answers. So let's quickly go through this as a class. What do you guys think the next step's gonna be? Leaving group off. If the leaving group were to fall off, we'd form a primary carbocation. Oh. Probably not super likely at this point, but what can that alkene do? Yeah, so the alkene in this case can grab a proton off of the tail end of the molecule, right? So if we do this, we need to be careful about the carbocation that we form. And specifically, we want to form the most stable carbocation. So the most stable carbocation is going to be right there. It's really important that you don't forget your carbons in this case. And you'll see why in a second. But what do you guys think the next step is after we form the stable carbocation? Yeah, the alcohol, in this case, can attack itself. So let's number this, and I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we're going to be forming a ring, and it's going to be a six-membered ring. We know that six-membered rings are a lot more stable than five, and they're a lot more stable than four, right? So six-membered rings are pretty favorable. So let's go ahead and draw our six-membered ring with oxygen as one of the ring positions. And just so we're not losing track, I'm going to go ahead and number everything here. So carbon-6 has two methyl groups attached, so we need to include those. And then the oxygen still has a hydrogen off of it, so it's got a positive charge. So oxygen's position one, position two, three, four, five, six. Carbon six still has those two methyl groups coming off of it, but it also has a covalent bond to oxygen now. Does that make sense? I get what you're doing. I would just, it wouldn't have to be carbon six, but I was saying maybe carbon five. Okay, I guess ring position number six. I should have been more <laughs> careful with describing it. And then last but not least, we'll just do a generic deprotonation. So I'll do minus H plus to indicate that this can be deprotonated by a number of different molecules or even just be a part of the catalytic cycle itself. So there we go. Cyclization reactions are really common in second and third term organic chemistry, but it's important to remember that six-membered rings are usually the uh, most common ring size that you'll see. You'll occasionally see five-membered rings, but you really won't ever see a formation of a four-membered ring um, unless we're talking about some unusual circumstances. So it's important to remember with these acid catalyzed hydration reactions that any alcohol can work and it can even be a cyclization reaction with itself. They're a little tricky sometimes. Does that make sense? Can I ask a question? Yeah. I was having a hard time when I was numbering um, because I didn't, I didn't think to stop where the positive charge was. I just kind of along the positive chain. So I ended up with seven. Okay. Um, but is that, is that because if, because there wouldn't be a primary carbocation, we know that it would be tertiary. And so you just choose to stop where the yeah, so in this case, Grace was asking, can you stop at 6 or stop at 7? Really, either would work. If you did 7, it would just mean that methyl group's dangling off of the ring system. But it's important to remember whenever you're doing an acid-catalyzed hydration or a um, hydrohalogenation, you always form the more stable carbocation. So only up to the point of that positive charge is where the ring closes. Exactly. The ring's only going to close in on that positive charge because the nucleophilic site's always going to attack that carbocation. All right, so let's change gears and talk about a little bit of a problem. And this involves a new reaction. So let's say we've got water around and I want to react it with, oops, sorry, this alkene, and I've got catalytic acid. What do you think the major product's going to be out of this? So I'll give you guys a minute to work on this, but try to figure out what the main product would be.
I'll just get this going a little bit with some basic arrow pushing. So we know we always protonate that alcohol first. Oop. Actually, let me draw out all of these hydrogens just so we've got clear arrow pushing. What's the next step? Yeah, we're going to protonate our alkene. And when we do this, we always want to form our more stable carbocation. Now what? Yeah, hydride shift. So water could attack into that carbocation. However, we know if a rearrangement can occur, it most likely will occur. So we've got this hydride over here. This can pop on over. That will result in the more stable carbocation. Now we've got water around. This water can attack the carbocation center. And then last but not least, we know we're going to lose a proton through some sort of proton transfer. So the main problem with those acid catalyzed hydrations that we saw is that you have to worry about rearrangement chemistry. Rearrangement chemistry is a really common feature with these sorts of reactions. So let's make a note of that. So rearrangements can and will occur, which makes it a little bit hard if you wanted that alcohol to, let's say, come off of, let's highlight it, this green carbon up here. If you wanted the alcohol to come off of that green carbon, it's going to be a lot more challenging, um, simply because if you add in your water and catalytic acid, it's actually going to add in to the other carbon after it rearranges. So chemists don't like running into problems. They like finding solutions. Unfortunately, yeah, you like that solution fun? <laughs> so one of the solutions isn't the most environmentally friendly solution, but it works. The solution is to use mercuric acetate. Chemists, for the most part, frown upon the use of mercury, but in this case, it's kind of unavoidable for this sort of reaction. And these are called oxymercuration, demercuration reactions. So again, I like to separate these into steps. So step one is we have this mercuric acetate. Which looks like this. And this is kind of a beefy molecule to draw, so we're going to use some abbreviations. Specifically, this group, which is the same as this group over here. We're going to abbreviate these as acetate groups. So typically, when you see this drawn in your textbook, or written out in your textbook, you'll see it written as HGOAC. Too. It's a lot easier than drawing out this big bulky molecule. The first step is that when you put this into solution, it's in equilibrium where one of these OAC groups falls off. So that oxygen just gets popped off, which forms our active reagent. So now this mercury is missing electrons. It's got a positive charge. And then over here, we've got that leaving group that fell off. OK, in step two, we're going to use this active reagent. And I'm going to abbreviate this active reagent as HGOAC. And the HG has now got a positive charge on it. 
And we're going to use just a really generic alkene. Let me clean this up. We're going to use this alkene over here. So we know that alkenes make pretty good nucleophiles. In this case, the mercury's got a positive charge. That makes, makes it a really good electrophile, right? So we're just going to have nucleophilic attack of that mercury center. When this happens, you still form your more stable carbocation, right? So in this case, our tertiary carbocation is going to be a, a lot more favorable. So now that the mercury's got this lone pair hanging out, that lone pair coming off of this giant mercury atom really wants to snuggle up close to that positive charge. So essentially it's just going to pop down and form this three-membered ring. This is one of the few situations where you can show this as equilibrium, even though that um, sigma bond's being made and broken, right? So normally with resonance structures, we don't show making or breaking of sigma bonds, but this is actually allowable. Where yep. you get that X from methyl group from? From bond. So we've got this CH3. Is that the one you're talking about? And then, the, and then the, yeah. that's being carried through here and here? Oh, it's flipped upside down. That's yeah, exactly. Yeah, I just kind of moved it down a little bit so that it wasn't running into the mercury. All right, so at this point, we've got our mercurinium ion, which is a mouthful to say. And this mercurinium ion is a really useful intermediate. So in step three, we're going to take this mercurinium ion and we're going to actually react it. So I'm going to usually show you guys the mercurinium ion as a three-membered ring. Oh, let me clean this up. I won't draw the full equilibrium. There we go. And in this step, if you treat it with water, your water is going to really want to attack one of the atoms in this ring. And so now we've got to justify which atom it's going to attack. Do you think it's going to attack the mercury? Probably not, right? The mercury has already got uh, three bonds to it, so it's not super likely. However, if we think about this, this carbon right there has a lot of partial positive charge on it, right? Because its electron density is being pulled away towards that mercury. So let's go ahead and draw a dipole arrow showing that imbalance of electron density. So mercury is hogging all the electron density. That means that the water is most likely going to reach in from this back side, similar to an SN2 reaction, and attack that carbon. At this point, it's going to slingshot this open and return that electron density back to the mercury. So I almost think of this as a mousetrap. So as soon as the water hits, the mousetrap opens up. So when the water adds in, it's still protonated. And now we've got that mercury still on. After this, we're going to do a proton transfer. So we're just going to deprotonate that alcohol, similar to what we saw in the acid-catalyzed hydration reaction. And we're just going to pluck it off. So typically when I show these, I just try to simplify this. So we're just going to pluck off one of these protons. I'm not going to show the full proton transfer, though. So now we've got our intermediate. You can actually isolate it at this step. It's really stable. You can bottle it up. However, most Organic chemists aren't interested in organomercury compounds. Does anybody know why? 
They're super duper toxic. There was a chemist a few years ago who was working with organomercury. She spilled a pin drop on her gloves. She actually had two pairs of gloves on. It went through, straight through her gloves and killed her like three months later. This stuff is incredibly toxic, incredibly hard to work with. So most chemists have preferred to avoid this reaction. However, there are some cases where we um, need to work with it. We won't be doing it in the lab. We will not be doing <laughs> this one in the lab. <laughs> <laughs> Six lab sessions this week. You're on your own. <laughs> That's only for the students I don't like. <laughs> I, remember, I worked with, this is a complete side story. I worked with this chemist once, and he was a little weird. Um, and he was walking by my desk one day with this bottle of mercuric acetate and goes, wouldn't want this to get in your coffee now, would we? And I was, is this guy trying to kill me? <laughs> Yeah, this is not fun stuff to work with. <laughs> so in the end, we want to get rid of the mercury. Um, we're not going to go through this full mechanism. But essentially what you're going to do is treat this with a reagent called sodium borohydride. So NaBH4. However, I'll put a little asterisk here and say you don't need to know the mechanism. The mechanism is actually thought to be a radical mechanism, and it's fairly complicated. So the last step of this reaction is that you just reduce it off using sodium borohydride. The key takeaway from this is that this is a useful transformation anytime you want to avoid rearrangement chemistry. So this is only used when you need to avoid rearrangements. It will work on alkenes that don't undergo rearrangement, but the reality is it's so environmentally unfriendly and toxic, nobody would choose that route. Yep? I'm a little bit confused because this looks just like the molecule we got last time. Yeah, so in this case, I just showed one example. But for example, let's actually do the top molecule. So let's do that alkene. That's a good question. So let's say we use water plus this alkene. Oops, sorry, I added in one too many methyl groups. And then in step one, we're going to use HgO Ac2. We're going to form that mercuranium ion. Water will attack in. And then in step two, we need to reduce it off. So we use NaBH4. And now, instead of observing the rearrangement, we only get the alcohol coming off that one position. So we get no rearrangement. Does that make sense? It will work with any alkene, but it's usually picked anytime you're running into a problem where you don't want to observe any rearrangement. All right, now we get to go into this crazy new reaction. And this reaction is similar. We're still going to be focused on making alcohols. However, this time we're going to change the regiochemistry. So we've already gone through a couple of reactions. We said we can convert this into an alcohol using two different techniques, one that's environmentally friendly and one that's not so environmentally friendly. The first one we said was to use dilute acid and water. So you want to use that strong acid. We do our acid catalyzed hydration. The second one is to use mercuric acetate water in your first step 
and then in your second step we would use sodium boral hydride. They'll both get you to that same result. However, in both of these reactions, these are referred to as our Markovnikov products. What does it mean when I say a Markovnikov product? Yeah, the nucleophile is being added to the more substituted side of the alkene. There are some situations where we want to isolate the anti-Markovnikov product, but if we do that, we actually need to change the reaction conditions. So I'll call this our anti-Markovnikov reaction. And for this one, the reaction's a little bit complicated, but I got a nice surprise for you guys. The first step is we're going to use borane, so that's BH3. And borane, we said, is a really, really good Lewis acid. It's got an empty P orbital. So typically, whoop, this should be BH3. So typically, because it's got that empty P orbital, it's going to be coordinated to a solvent molecule. The solvent molecule that's typically used is going to be an ether. So we oftentimes see boron THF complexes. Does anybody remember what THF is? Oh, <laughs> that's the thing to it's get tetrahydrofuran. It's a cyclic ether. So THF looks like this. It's got lone pairs. We've got BH3 with this empty P orbital. So this lone pair really wants to be dumped into that borane p orbital. Really, it's just a nice way of isolating a bottle of borane. Borane's really unstable unless it's tied up as a Lewis acid base adduct. So that's the first reagent we use. The second step of reagents we use is hydrogen peroxide and sodium hydroxide. And if we do this, we can actually form an alcohol. However, now we get our anti-Markovnikov alcohol, where the alcohol comes off the less substituted side. I'm going to erase this down here. So anti-Markovnikov hydration. So this can be a really useful synthetic tool depending on the type of alcohol you're looking to get. We're not going to go into this reaction in too much detail. However, I did want to explain a little bit about why that alcohol is going off the more sub or less substituted side. And the main reason has to do with both electronics and sterics. So if we've got this borane it can kind of dock with the alkene. And the hydrogen will actually get added to the more substituted side, and then the less substituted side will coordinate with the boron. So let's take a look at the transition state. You go through this four-membered ring transition state with the boron, or sorry, the borane. And then last but not least, the intermediate that you get has a hydrogen coming off the more substituted side, and then your boron coming off the less substituted side. This will go through a couple of more reactions that involve the hydrogen peroxide, oh, and eventually your alcohol will be added to the less substituted side of the alkene. The reality is this mechanism is something like 12 steps long, and I decided a few years ago it just wasn't worth class time to go over because it's super duper tedious. Um, however, I put the Khan Academy video link on here, and it's available in your textbook. Um, I won't have you guys be tested on the full mechanism, but I do want you guys to know how to use this in terms of a, a chemical transformation. So no, if you want that anti-Markovnikov product, you need to use these reagents. Does that make sense? 
There will be a handful of these reactions throughout this term where I tell you you don't need to know the mechanism, but I do want you to know which reagents are needed. Yep? Do we need to worry at all about that weird bond that comes between boron molecules of the same, that half, that like? The transition state? Um, I mean this guy? It has to do, it's, why, it's why we need to have the THF to keep the boron from bonding with itself. It's like a weird, I don't know what it's called, it's like a weird. The Lewis acid base adduct? The electrons split both ways to form like a, a very weird bond. It's not called it's not ionic, but it's between. Is it the one where it ends up with like one double Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm not overly concerned with you guys understanding the chemistry of the Lewis acid base adduct, but I do want you to know that if you want to accomplish that anti-Markovnikov hydration, that these are the reagents you need to use. That's really it at this point. There's one other thing we need to think about when we're doing this reaction, and that is the stereochemistry. Right now, I've only told you guys that the alcohol is going to add to the less substituted side of the alkene, but we need to think about whether or not it's forming one stereocenter or the other. So let's take a look at that really quick. So remember, regiochemistry says which carbon's being attacked. Stereochemistry is saying the relative position of the things being added. So in this case, the stereochemistry is going to involve syn addition. <laughs> of your hydrogen that was added and your alcohol. So let me show you guys what I mean by that. So let's say we've got this alkene. Whoop. And I react this with a borane THF complex followed by hydrogen peroxide and NaOH. Which carbon is the alcohol going to be added to the red carbon or the blue carbon? Red carbon, right? It's the less substituted side of the alkene. So we know we're going to have an alcohol add in there. And so I'm just going to arbitrarily draw this as a wedge. That means that the hydrogen being added onto that blue carbon must also be a wedge. It's going to be coming off the same face of the alkene. So we have to be aware of the syn addition which means that this methyl group is going to be a dash. And in this case, we would also observe a second product where the alcohol is a dash. And what does that mean about the hydrogen that was added? Yeah, it must also be a dash. What's the relationship between these two products? Yeah, they're a racemic mixture of enantiomers. So in this case, we would observe a mixture of products. So a racemic mixture of enantiomers. However, the key takeaway is that this hydrogen is going to be on the same side of the ring as that alcohol. And in the other enantiomer, you can see it's also on the same side of the ring as the alcohol. That's a really important feature of these hydroboration oxidation reactions. One good trick to remembering uh, anti-Markovnikov addition is anytime you see peroxides, it's probably going to be anti-Markovnikov addition. So can you guys see how we have peroxide here? And then when we added in peroxides with HBr, we also got anti-Markovnikov addition. It's a really simple trick you can use to determine the regiochemistry of your reaction. I thought we said peroxide was R-O-O-R. -O -O yeah, so the reality is for uh, hydrohalogenation, any peroxide will work. Um, for this reaction, the hydroboration oxidation, you almost exclusively see hydrogen peroxide. This is a really simple trick that will help you a lot with determining regiochemistry of your products. All right, one last reaction today. <laughs> and luckily, this reaction we saw last term. We already um, did a bromination reaction in lab already. It's a pretty simple, straightforward reaction, but it's very useful. So let's change to halogenation reactions. 
So with halogenation reactions, instead of having HBr, you're just going to react this with elemental bromine, so Br2. And this is a little confusing. The alkene is still going to be your nucleophile. But in this case, your bromine is going to act as an electrophile. Normally, we think of electrophiles as something having a partial positive charge, right? In this case, we would say this has no net dipole. Where's the partial positive? The reality is that this has a strong enough instantaneous dipole or London dispersion force to allow this addition to occur. So it's an unusual electrophile. That's a larger molecule. Exactly. Bromine's a nice, big, squishy molecule, so the electrons can move around, and that means that they're more likely to be attacked than um, smaller molecules. So this alkene can attack the bromine and then kick off our bromide. The weird thing is that you end up forming a three-membered ring out of this. We said that six-membered rings are more stable. This is one of the weird exceptions where a three-membered ring is actually quite stable. And this is called a bromonium ion. And we also had bromide, which was kicked off as a leaving group. This looks pretty similar to that mercuranium ion we saw, right, where mercury was in the three-membered ring. And in that reaction, the water attacked where? Yeah, the partial positive carbon. So in this case, we've got a similar situation where the bromine's sucking up electron density away from that carbon. That means that this bromide is going to attack that carbon and slingshot this open. Oh, let me clean this up, sorry. So now we've got our brominated compound. You can do this with uh, chlorine. However, in our textbook, you'll almost exclusively see it done with bromine. It doesn't work as well with chlorine as it does with bromine. Um, the other thing, too, is um, how many of you guys had a chance to check out the web page on the class website? On the bottom of the home page, there's a whole section talking about brominated vegetable oils. Um, if you're into food science at all, it's a really hotly contested thing right now. Um, they add brominated vegetable oils to a lot of beverages, at least in the United States, to help um, mix the uh, food dyes with the uh, aqueous liquid, obviously. So you think about trying to mix an organic food dye with um, a water-based soda. It's really hard to do. If you let it sit out, your organic food dye might float to the top. So they add in brominated vegetable oils to help mix it. It's been banned in the European Union. Um, there's a lot of um, questions regarding... Um, how safe it is for human consumption. So it's something important to think about, and I think a little bit of food for thought with organic chemistry. <laughs> the other thing that's really important to note with this reaction is that the bromines are on opposite sides of the alkene, right? So these reactions typically go through an anti-addition mechanism. So one bromine will be on one face of the alkene, the other will be on the other face. And this molecule, we don't really have stereocenters, so it doesn't matter, but in molecules where you are forming stereocenters, it's something to be aware of. So let's take an example of this. So you show one is the wedge and one is the dash. Yeah, so let's do the same example we saw before, where we are forming a stereocenter. So we'll take this alkene, we'll do Br2, and when we do this, if this bromine's a dash, the other bromine should be what? Wedge. A wedge, right? Is this the only product we're going to get out? Nope, we could get a mixture of products out of this, right? So if we think about this, and a lot of these addition reactions, if you're forming stereocenters, you oftentimes have to be aware of the potential for forming a racemic mixture of enantiomers, right? But the key takeaway, just like we saw before, is you have to pay attention to the face 
that these molecules are adding onto. So this bromine is being added onto the opposite face of that bromine, and there are two possible options for doing that, right? So just like before, we're going to get a mixture of enantiomers. All right, do you guys want to try a challenge problem with our last five minutes? A little bit trickier. It's not super hard. <laughs> For the most part, do you think it's too fast, too slow? I could speed it up. I'll need some Adderall. <laughs> All right, we'll do a practice problem. And I'm going to abbreviate the substituents. And in this case, let's react it with bromine. And let's determine what our product would be or products, for that matter. You want the stepwise mechanism? Yeah, let's do the full stepwise mechanism. I'll get you guys started with the first step since it's easy. There's an important thing to remember about pi bonds though, right? Pi bonds go above and below their carbon, right? So that P lobe containing the pi bond is on both faces of that carbon. So the bromine can attack from that top face or the bottom face of your alkene. It's a little bit weird to think about it that way, but I'll show you guys what I mean by that. So let's say we've got a bromine that attacks from the top face. That means that this methyl group is going to be a wedge. This hydrogen is going to be a dash. This methyl group is going to be a wedge. And this ethyl group is going to be a dash. So that would be our top face attack. And we would observe the bottom face attack. What's the relationship between these two intermediates? Yeah, they're both equally likely, but are they identical enantiomers, diastereomers? So let's say I take this one on the right and I spin it around and try to overlay it. No, the ethyls and hydros. Yeah, in this case, they're not identical. In fact, you're forming two different enantiomers as your intermediates. So. We might get a mixture of products out of this. And in this case, we know we've got Br minus floating around that could attack either of these. And we'll get into this more later, but the bromine really likes to attack the more substituted side and ring open this. However, it doesn't really matter because the outcome's the same. So when we do this, we've got anti-addition still. But with this one, we've got the opposite anti-addition. So we're going to be forming a mixture of enantiomers out of this, specifically a racemic mixture. So does that make sense? Anytime you're forming stereocenters with these brominations, you should Consider the enantiomeric product also as a, an 
product that might accompany it. These can be a little bit tricky. I would encourage you guys right away to start going through the problems in the textbook. So the easiest approach, I think, is read through the section in the textbook. They have a skill builder problem where they walk you through an example. And then what they do is they have like six or seven practice problems. Do those right away. Don't put them off until the next quiz because before you know it, you're going to have like eight more reactions that you have to know. Um, so just try to do them a little bit each day. Um, if you talk to anybody that's taken this course in the past, you'll hear that there's just a ton of reactions we have to get through. The earlier you start practicing them, the easier things will be on you later on. So don't let things uh, pile up too big. Um, I will be available on Thursday and Friday afternoons too. So if you want one-on-one -on -one appointments, um, I'm more than happy to meet with you. In particular, we can just go through book problems together. Um, if that doesn't work for you, try to find a study group or just work through them at home with your uh, study guide. All right, good luck on the pod. The pod also involves a reaction from last term. So you might need to use some chemistry from last term a little bit too.